Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm um, Annie Burke. I'm the executive director of Together Bay Area. Um, I'm in uh, Berkeley, California right now, which in territory, Confederated Villages of Lejeune, she, her pronouns, and super, super happy to be here. This is a project um, that has been a constant source of learning and fun and real connection. And I'm really excited to, to be here today and to connect you all to this project and the folks that are involved. Um, uh, this, uh, this event, this webinar that you're, you're either participating in live or watching later on YouTube um, is really about sharing progress on a multi-year project. Um, this project started with an idea, a question back in 2019 um, and has grown into something that's been really productive and positive and fruitful. Um, and it's a project, it's actually more of an exploration than a project. Um, it's a series of questions and a series of relationships and connections and all kinds of things that we're trying to um, connect. A, and I'm, I'm just really excited for you to, I'm not going to summarize it because my colleagues are going to summarize it, but it's a really, really interesting um, exploration project that we've been a part of. Um, and we're really curious what your reactions and questions are going to be. Um, this is not something that we have, uh, you know, neatly figured out perfectly. It's a, it, there's a lot of learning and exploration. So really hope that you'll participate today in the, in the chat with questions. Um, I want to start with just a, a few acknowledgements and some gratitude. Um, one acknowledgement is that we're all on indigenous land right now, wherever you are. Um, and that we're doing a lot um, at the regional scale, local scale, and at the state scale to build and create right relations between native and non-native uh, tribes and groups, as well as uh, right relations between people and place and people in nature. Um, our right relations program, which I'm not going to talk about because I really want to get to the meat of today's conversation, um, but is all of the right relations program is, is launching again for a 2024 phases. Um, and that program is a partnership with Redbud Resource Group and is all about um, right relations. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge land, but I also want to acknowledge that there's a lot happening in this in this space. Um, and uh, I want to celebrate that. I also want to acknowledge that there's lots of reasons why you may be here today and might be interested in this topic. Um, maybe it's because of community engagement, um, and that's the work that you do. Maybe it's conservation planning. Maybe it's urban planning. Um, maybe there's a park or an open space or trails that you work on. Maybe you're a, an animalologist of some kind. You're here because you really love monarchs. Um, I know there's one of you in this group that uh, has something for the Mission Blue Butterflies. Shout out to Stu Weiss. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why you're here and they're all valid and they're all um, gonna be, help contribute to this conversation. So thank you for coming. I wanna share some gratitude um, for the State Coastal Conservancy who's funding this project. I see a bunch of uh, Coastal Conservancy staff here, which is fantastic. Um, the Coastal Conservancy is just such an excellent partner for um, Together Bay Area members in the region doing all kinds of different work and the support that we've received for this project has been outstanding and really um, we're so grateful so thank you. Um, and I also want to uh, thank everyone who's been involved we're going to hear from a bunch of the team today, um, but there's lots of other people who have played smaller big roles um, and I'm, you know. I'm going to get the kind of Oscars hook if I, or the music's going to cue if I name all of them. Um, but I, there are a lot of people that have been involved in this and, and um, want to thank them all. Um, so the project team, um, who I also could go on and on about, uh, because they're just an outstanding group of people that I feel very privileged to work with. Um, and I want to introduce them and we'll dive right into our program. So um, Laura Rosenthal is here. She's our membership and communications coordinator at Together Bay Area. And she's uh, working the DJ tables, the Zoom DJ tables on this event and has helped with registration and, and behind the scenes coordination. Uh, Vincel is here from Yes Nature to Neighborhoods and he is gonna speak in a little bit along with Olivia Van Dam from Cal Academy. Um, and we also have Avery Hill and um, Allison Young and 
Tom Robinson and Rebecca Johnson, and they're all a uh, part of this team and you're going to hear from all of them. And so with no more blah, blah, blahs for me, I want to turn it over to Rebecca Johnson with Cal Academy of Sciences. Rebecca. Thanks so much, Annie, and um, thanks everyone for, for being here today. Um, like Annie said, this project has been a real joy, like something that we've worked on since the first little idea sparked in 2019. And I think um, I'm really excited to have everyone presenting about it today, because one of the coolest things about this project is how so many of us with various expertise came together to work on this project. Um, and I think it's really like emblematic of the kind of work that we try to do in our Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the Cal Academy and that Together Bay Area tries to do and that I know YES um, does as well, like collaborating with people and with um, other community partners. And this is just a way for us all to come together. So it's my job to set the stage kind of and tell you all the story of how this work came to be. So um, it is really a story. So in 2019, um, Allison and I, along with our previous data um, biodiversity um, scientist, Gio Rapicciolo, were at the Conservation Lands Network 2.0 celebration and launch. I'm guessing many of you were there too at the Moore Foundation. And it was a real celebration of this incredible work that so many people had worked so hard to produce this map. Obviously, it's not just a map. <laughs> it's a set of conservation planning tools. but this is a screenshot of, um, you know, the, the priority lands writ large um, in the Conservation Lands Network tool. And as Alice and I were sitting there, I remember looking at this map, being amazed and awed, and then turning to her and saying something like, hey, like, what about all the urban areas? Like, what about all those gray areas? Um, and next slide, Alison. And so one of the reasons I was especially interested in in those areas is that over the previous like almost 10 years before that meeting, Allison and I had been working in our community science department to engage people throughout the Bay Area in making observations of plants and animals wherever they were. And in many cases, where they were, were was in those gray areas, right? And so they were observing and seeing plants and animals and biodiversity. And one of the huge parts of our jobs was encouraging people to make those observations everywhere. And so we knew not only were people making observations, you can see that throughout the whole Bay Area right there are now about four, almost four and a half million observations that have been shared on iNaturalist. Many of those are in that kind of gray area that you saw in the Conservation Lands Network map. Um, and so we knew that there was tons of data about where plants and animals were in those gray urban areas and also throughout the rest of the, the Bay Area and that those data weren't being used to help inform the um, conservation priorities in the Conservation Lands Network. And so we said, hey, like I wonder if we could do something really cool and work with Tom in the Conservation Lands Network and try to bring these data into that decision-making tool. And also at the same time, think about urban areas more and in our department, we also were um, really interested in trying to partner more meaningfully and more deeply with community-based organizations. Um, I saw a little thing in the chat about someone not being able to see the graphics. Are you all on that? Okay, good. Um, and so, so we we approached, we like started talking about what this project could be. And so, next slide, Allison. So we thought about how could we look at the Conservation Lands Network, at the priority lands, at the priority streams, look at the iNaturalist data that existed, and think about where are these gaps um, in our understanding, in our what iNaturalist observations we have, and what data we have to understand, especially that area, that Baylands to Uplands area, that connects some of these identified priority lands to the bay. And so we started digging deep into the data and we thought about like, where could we do this work? And we also overlaid um, data from Cal EnviroScreen, looking at um, disadvantaged communities and thinking about how we can engage folks um, more deeply in collecting data where they live and helping people in communities use the same kind of data that we would wanna use in the Conservation Lands Network 
um, also to help answer local questions. Next slide. So we um, reached out to Yes, Nature to Neighborhoods, an amazing group um, that works really deeply with the community um, of Richmond. And you'll hear more about them from Ben Sell in a little bit. And we um, sat down with them and said, hey, how can we think about collecting more iNaturalist data in the community of Richmond in ways that benefits your programs, um, that your folks that you work most closely with can use those data to help answer questions about the places that they live. And at the same time, how can we collect data along one of these priority streams and in an area that um, doesn't have a lot of iNaturalist data and really represents this connection between the, the Baylands and Uplands. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Allison to talk a little bit more like overview of the work that we did and then she'll turn it over to the rest of the team. Great, thanks Rebecca. Yeah, so um, Vincel and Olivia will talk a little bit more about this bio blitz that we co-designed with Yes Nature to Neighborhoods um, that we held this last February um, and how that came about to help us kind of gather data within the Richmond area um, and work um, with the community that Yes Nature to Neighborhoods has cultivated and worked with for years. Um, we also knew that we wanted to get more data just across the entire urban landscape in the Bay Area as well. Um, and so we took the list of the CLN's uh, species conservation targets and looked for species that really span that urban to open space area um, and that Baylands to Uplands area as well using iNaturalist observations and also help from the CLN advisory group. Um, and we ended up with 24 species or species groups. Um, and we noticed that a lot of those species have most of their observations like in the more natural areas of the Bay Area. And we really did want to get a better understanding of where they might be in those urban areas and that gray space, gray space in the CLN um, before building species distribution models. So we launched the Bay Area Urban Species Search um, at the end of March after the bio blitz that we did with YES, asking people across the Bay Area to look for and document these species, especially um, in the places where people live. So another way that we gathered more data in urban areas throughout the Bay Area. Um, Avery, Dr. Avery Hill on our team took this data from the bio blitz and from the urban species search um, to make species distribution models across the entire Bay Area. Um, here's an example for arboreal salamanders. Um, he also looked at just in the urban boundary of the Bay Area as well. Um, and the cool thing is that this really kind of allowed us to understand what variables are really important to these species in urban areas. and also gives us insight to like how we can think more about these urban spaces and improve habitat in these urban spaces for these species as well. Tom and Avery will talk more about this part um, of the project as well. But you know what one of the big takeaways from from this project we had <clears throat> um you know an amazing time working with yes nature neighborhoods an amazing organization and to really think about how we can kind of tie this like regional conservation planning to communities and the questions they have in their local places so we really do want to continue to partner and learn from community-based organizations like yes we want to continue to expand the ways that cbos and communities have a voice in conservation planning across the bay area um, while, like I said, like working to answer and address their questions and concerns about their local places as well um, in urban areas. So uh, hopefully for the CLN 3.0, those grayed out urban areas are going to have some nice color to them. Um, and we'll also have established some practices within Together Bay Area for how to bring community data and community voices into this regional conservation um, and how to address those local questions as well. Um, so at this point, I have the amazing pleasure of introducing Olivia Van Dam from our team at the California Academy of Sciences and Vincel Alfred from Yes Nature to Neighborhoods to talk about the development of our partnership um, and the bio blitz that we co-designed together. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Olivia Van Dam, um, she, her, and yes, I am a, a community science coordinator on Rebecca and Allison's team at Cal Academy. Um, Vincel? Yes, my name is Vincel Alfred. I am the Camp to Community Fellows Coordinator, which means <laughs> I'm, I'm a youth development coordinator at Yes State to the Neighborhoods, dealing with our team programs. But we all work with the families and youth of all ages as well. Great, next slide. 
So in building relationships, especially, you know, as we approach um, how we build relationships as a Western science institution, as this big museum with connecting deeper with local community-based organizations, I turned to some of my learnings from Rue Mapp, um, founder of Outdoor Afro, and remembered her saying, we move at the speed of relationships. Um, and this quote here says that that includes a sharing of privilege, a sharing of resources, and a sharing of platforms and networks. Um, and thinking about the healthy ecosystem of, of collaboration and, and what that means to bring everything together and ward off challenges and, and come together for building success as well. Next slide. So this is a, a brief timeline or a small snippet of our timeline uh, in building this relationship, really thinking about what it means to have meaningful trust building and multiple touch points and multiple check-ins throughout the over a year or more of, of our connections with um, Yes Nature to Neighborhoods. So starting uh, even before July, 2022, there were already relationships through Together Bay Area, through existing partnerships. And this is um, just a start of an invitation for Yes Nature to Neighborhoods to see Rebecca and Allison's uh, work. And also Point Melody has a few amazing organizations working to do a survey of biodiversity there. And so a Yes Nature to Neighborhoods team came out to do a BioBlitz in Richmond in July to see what a BioBlitz is even about and to get that experience of using iNaturalist in a space in their city. And then in the fall, we continued to meet on Zoom and had a in-person meeting at Cal Academy on our living roof and got to use iNaturalist uh, up there. You could see this fun selfie of our team um, and just had lunch together and got to talk more about this project and what the vision and goals are for our February BioBlitz that was mentioned earlier. Uh, the night before the BioBlitz, we had a family night where I went in person and Allison was on Zoom to introduce what we are doing and to practice what iNaturalist is, to download the app, to meet the families and get them excited for the next day's excursion and, and um, having fun together. And during that BioBlitz, um, we, we got to go out on trails and take amazing photos together and connect with one another um, out in nature at Wildcat Canyon and look at that creek and that watershed uh, together. And we also shared food again, um, barbecue, and that was an amazing way to just really uh, be part of community with one another. And then in March, after the BioBlitz, uh, Allison and Avery did a data share out. And this was a Zoom meeting where we had um, Spanish translation, and we also had um, amazing feedback and conversations with the community about about the data that they collected during that bio blitz. And then we invited Ben Sell to come with us to speak at a conference at the CSI, uh, con, um, CSI Symposium, which was the Community Science Association, Citizen Science Association conference in ASU. So this is just a snippet of our relationship and a timeline. Uh, next slide. And now just thinking about um, from Vincel's experience, Vincel, I'm just gonna ask you a few questions and, and ask you to speak to, you know, some of the families quotes that we have on the few next slides of what their experience was like throughout this relationship building process and how um, you felt this impacted the community and what how how the development of this project went. So if you wanna start with this of, you know, just this quote here, and the familiarity and excitement of you know how you built how how we built this together. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for um, shedding some light on the Yes Nature Neighborhoods experience. Um, yeah, these uh, these folks are more than comfortable out in nature. Um, like ninety to ninety nine percent of our programs are done out in nature. So for them to have a different perspective and understand that, um, you know, that our, like being comfortable in parks, um, this allowed our 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 
our participants to become, you know, to take technology and combine that with their experience in nature of being out in nature to become, you know, scientists. And um, and they are avid folks who um, love to, you know, to participate in anything that's advocacy for, you know, the greater good. And um, conservationism is really, um, you know, in their wheelhouse. So um, for them to be able to, to know that that they're not the only ones thinking that of this preservation and that there's a bigger picture was um you know really really um sat well with them wonderful thanks Vincel. next slide so this quote here of uh using this app as a tool to help us connect and identify urban biodiversity in our communities made us feel environmentally responsible I know as a Latina and a lot of um, indigenous communities and the black community, we feel this sense of responsibility, right? We have a, a viewpoint of responsibility um, in a way that I think that I heard these families really experience in a deeper way of, wow, I have, I have this way to contribute. I have this new way to be a responsible um, person. And I want to highlight that because I've heard it from the families and I heard it from you about what Yes Nature to Neighborhoods really wants to instill and empower um, youth and families to feel that sense of responsibility to their community. Do you want to expand on that or share more about this piece and about the advocacy and what this connection meant for them? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, no sooner than the um, bio blitz was over, they were, uh, we had folks asking like, when we're going to have the next one. And so at this point right now, it's uh, um, we're shooting for an annual, maybe around February, and they're hitting different spots within um, Richmond to basically, you know, try to fill in some of those gray areas that are on the conservation lands map. And um, we also um, like 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 when, when Olivia showed earlier when we gave the the, the there was a pre event meeting so they can get the context and there was a post event meeting so they can get further context of what their experience how it contributed you know now and then we're also putting that word out that this doesn't have to be you don't have to wait for a yes event to use iNaturalist you don't have to you know it doesn't have to be in a park and uh, this could be done on a flower on the sidewalk it can be done in your front yard you know off your porch so but folks were excited that they could do something where they didn't, there were no barriers to any travel or any access or anything like that. They could just jump right in and be advocates. Wonderful. Thank you. Next slide. So, you know, at the conclusion and, and continuation of this experience, like you said, Vincel, I really see this as a continuum of introducing a amazing tool and also tapping into the already existing knowledge of Richmond that these families and students have. Uh, can you share more about how, you know, what some of these key takeaways that we have on this slide here? And also, if you can just share what your experience is as a, as a leader and as an employee and, and person who is kind of leading this experience and, and some of your takeaways. Definitely, yes. Um, for one, it's um, this provided empowerment to the community. Um, they felt like their voices could be heard when, you know, um, you know, prior to this, you know, there there was no knowledge of how, you know, they can get that heard outside of you know, conventional means, where this is something that they can do on their own, their own time in their own space and be able to contribute significantly. Um, and they know, and we all know that, you know, urban areas are our, our habitats for, you know, raccoons and possums and butterflies and very, thousands of species of birds. So, um, you know, this was a, this, this experience gave them the tools and the, um, the, the wherewithal to be able to contribute to that um, in, in a significant manner. And it gives, just empowering the community to feel like they can make a difference because in these underserved communities, just, ha just knowing that your voice can be heard can be um, a major, you know, a major catalyst to, you know, more conservationism. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think these quotes here just really highlight that as well. And just um, a really beautiful fo photo of us on Wildcat Creek 
looking at lichen, looking at um, salamanders, and it was just a really lovely day. And and I'm just excited that you all are can continue to do bio blitzing and um, are you know we will hopefully continue and be partners for a long time. And I've just really appreciated getting to know you. And I think the invitation um, for the next slide. Allison, for us to all present together at a conference and to have um, three case studies that we it, we actually partnered with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, who are partners for City Nature Challenge, um, which is another uh, community science campaign that our team runs, and that um, you know that experience in this conference of sharing and having community partners that we work with in community science there at this conference to share about their experience and then have a discussion with the wider field of community science practitioners and academia and universities. Uh, it was just a really powerful talk. And then Sal, I just want you to share any um, thoughts about this experience and coming to Arizona with us and speaking um, about your program and about this partnership. Yes, again, thank you for that invitation. And um, the experience, it was a, it was a life-changing and career-enhancing experience for me um, to be able to present our story and the feedback that we received from the folks that were in attendance. I was kind of blown away myself. I, it was very humbling. Um, and also to see the, the this is my first um, Seaside conference, and I didn't know really what to expect, but to see how how vast the commute the the um, citizens community science um, scope is, and and how many different facets there are was was mind jarring actually, and um, so I was eager to like I was jotting notes the whole time, just saying how can I bring this back home? How can I get involved with San Pablo Library? How can I get involved with Richmond Library for lending tools and various apparatuses to be able to contribute to the success and further you know, practices of folks doing their um, citizen science, community science work. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Vincel, I really appreciate you. And and um, thank you so much to the Cal Academy team for also, you know, starting this relationship and having um, me join and get involved. And thanks to Together Bay Area for this webinar and to the whole community. And um, I am uh, next slide. We're excited to um, pass it on to Tom Robinson and Dr. Avery Hill. Um, Tom is on Together Bay Area's team and Dr. Avery Hill is with on our team at Cal Academy to speak more to these um, the CLN and to the species distribution models. We're so excited about the bridge of connecting the community experience and what is behind and who is the community in community science, like that talk we gave, and and then to pass it on to looking deeper at the data and how that's gonna inform um, future decision-making. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tom Robinson, Resilient Lands Lead and the Project Director for the Conservation Lands Network for Together Bay Area. Um, Avery, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Avery Hill. Um, I'm a postdoctoral scholar uh, or um, uh, researcher here at the California Academy of Sciences and the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science. Excellent. Well, Avery, it's been such a pleasure to work with you and get to learn alongside you about the analysis methods that you use to take the very data collected by folks like the YES community um, using iNaturalist and other apps. and you know, begin to turn them into products that can actually inform land use decision making, perhaps through the CLN. That's the goal. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, before this project, um, did you know about the CLN? No, I, I actually did not know about the CLN. Um, but I, I heard it together Bay Area. But when I was brought into the project, the, the, the CLN was new to me. Um, but it it really seemed like a uh, like a like an incredible tool <laughs> that a lot of them went into uh, that was really useful for coordinating and informing like local conservation uh, in the Bay Area. But but um, yeah, Tom, I I'd like to hear a bit more about it um, from you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so the CLN is a tool, just as you said, for organizing regional land conservation. It's also a set of geography specific habitat goals for biodiversity conservation. 
Um, and it's also a set of maps and um, kind of online mapping tools that can be used by um, local practitioners, like many of the folks who are on the call today, um, and funders to support reaching um, these specific habitat goals, um, as well as a region-wide goal of conserving 50% of land and waters um, by the year 2050, which we're, we're on target. Um, and, but I have to say, as, as Avery, you and I have absolutely sort of, you know, learned through this project, the real thing that makes the CLM click are the, you know, 150 experts and practitioners who contribute um, not just um, data to the CLN, but who make the hard decisions about how to prioritize land and habitats. Um, and for this project, we put a, a call out to the group um, and these people answered that call. These folks kind of linked arms with us to go through the 100 or so CLN uh, native species, what we call conservation targets. These are um, species that we wanna make sure um, we can serve enough land for them to persist into the future. And we ask which of these species use and perhaps even need um, both rural sort of natural areas and, and urban areas, um, which is not a, a simple question to, to answer. Um, but as Allison mentioned before, you know, they helped us identify 24 plants and animals who use urban spaces for their life histories. Um, and so I just wanna really, um, thank these individuals for their expert help, their time. Um, we have to, like I said, link arms and really um, uh, uh, have a, a good discussion. And you, Avery, you were, you were a part of that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of CLN in a nutshell and kind of how it intersects with this, this, this project. Great, thanks Tom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we've been hearing a lot about <laughs> these gray areas, uh, mm -hmm. these urban areas and, 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 and these uh, CLN maps and data products. Um, so it was interesting, yeah, to come into this project and learn more about that and, and, and to see these uh, these kind of gaps or opportunities. And um, yeah, yeah I, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about, you know, how the CLN has approached these urban areas before. How, how did how did these areas kind of get grayed out? Um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, as as Allison and Rebecca mentioned. You know, the the CLN currently treats urban areas sort of monolithically. You know, without without nuance. Um, and this is certainly the dominant paradigm in conservation planning. Um, uh, but we know that you know we miss the full picture when we do that. Um, we also sort of by masking out the urban areas, we miss the very folks who live in urban areas who are already collecting valuable data as, as those great graphics at the beginning showed um, in their own neighborhoods. Um, so we're wondering, you know, how many more folks can be maybe motivated and um, uh, you know, attracted to the sort of the cycle of conservation planning, which is collect information, analyze the information and get it into the hands of decision makers. Um, and so from a scientific standpoint um, and, or a conservation planning standpoint, you know, we know that urban areas are perhaps certainly not as um, biologically productive as intact natural areas. But thanks to the work of um, folks uh, at the um, San Francisco Estuary Institute who put together uh, Making Nature's City, I just put a link in the chat. Um, also the LA Biodiversity Index, you know, these are kind of um, works that are really demonstrating that urban areas do play a role in the health of an urbanized and urbanizing region um, like, the, like the Bay Area. So we're motivated to take urban biodiversity seriously. And, and this, is, this project is our first step to shift our approach, to kind of shift that paradigm to one that includes urban areas and no longer maps them out. Um, yeah, uh, one other thing I would just mention is that, um, you know, without incorporating urban areas in the CLN, it's just an incomplete picture of regional biodiversity needs. And I just want to reiterate that we also, it's an incomplete um, uh, invitation to uh, folks who are, you know, collecting important information out there. If we're only looking at, you know, the, herb, the rural areas uh, and collecting data there, um, we're missing a lot of the great data collection that happens in the urban areas by enthusiasts and, and people who live in urban areas. But Avery, I want to turn the tables here. You know, 
you have you in particular have played a really key role in in this bridge that we're talking about, kind of bridging the the science and the data collection on the, um, from the community science. So I'm curious, from your perspective, how did we blend the CLN and community science in these species distribution models that you put together? What what elements were blended? Great. Well, I I think I'll use the I'll use the word species distribution model to to illustrate this. The the species that we use were entirely informed by um, the the work that went into the conservation lands network, that, which identified kind of local conservation targets. Along with our sealand advisors, we pared down you know, this huge list of conservation targets to a select number of species that we thought we could uh, produce produce maps and models for. Uh, mm -hmm. The distribution part of the species distribution model came from came from you know the community members that collected information about where you know these 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 particular species have been found um and then the modeling part is uh is what i did and uh or led in in, in collaboration with, with a lot of people on this call um and so uh next slide allison please oh i'm sorry maybe that was yeah next slide please um so so here are the here are the 20 uh 24 species or species groups uh that we used um from informed from the cln uh um, network and CLN advisors um and if you go to the next slide Allison. and I'll, I'll talk about one in particular I, i'm a plant biologist so my heart is usually with plants but uh but 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 this uh uh coastal range shoulder band snail has slowly uh uh or maybe disproportionately quickly kind of found its way in my heart um this this species is endemic to kind of the coastal range and pretty much in the bay area which means it's pretty much only found here and uh, through the campaign, uh, if you could hit the next slide, Allison, we increased the amount of observations by um, like a bit more than 35%. So there's 140 observations. We have about 200, um, 190 now. Um, so, you know, for, for a pretty uh, uncommon species, this is in just a matter of like weeks, getting that many observations is, is, is incredibly, uh, is a huge um, uh, you know, success. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so you know, we did this with all these species that we mentioned before, um, and from these, the distribution data collected by the community members, and then the, the species that were informed uh, from the CLN, we then produced some maps. So, Allison, if you can go to the next one. So here's here's just a map. You saw one earlier for their arboreal salamander, um, but we produced uh, models, uh, statistical kind of representations of you know the relationships between. Where these species were found and different environmental variables that were actually also informed from the from the CLN and produ we produced maps like this one um, where we kind of estimated the presence and absence across these areas. And what we found is you can just kind of look here. You can see some of these urban areas if you're familiar with the kind of Bay Area. You know the, the, these 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 snails are 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 you know living among us. <laughs> um, and then uh, if you get to the next one, Allison. Uh, we looked at a bunch of variables that were that informed uh, kind of the distribution of these different species. Uh, the ones at the closer to the bottom are the ones that were more important for for these models. Um, the most important for this snail in particular was you know, distance to ten acre green space. So large kind of green spaces uh, were important for the snails, but for other species, it turned out that that other other variables that were less kind of related to like large green spaces were also important. If you get the next one, Allison. And so you can see here just a relationship between the habitat suitability that we modeled and the distance to 10 acre green space. And the cool thing is we can do this with all sorts of different uh, environmental variables and learn about kind of what shapes these species distributions and be able to take these findings and say, oh, well, it looks like, you know, maybe even two acre, two acre green space is important for these species. So advocating for, you know, two acre parks or, or greater in certain areas. And if you go to the next, oh, and then I think Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Avery, so much. Um, uh, this stuff is so exciting to folks um, who are in conservation planning, but I think just for anybody um, to that that sort of cares about biodiversity, um, I I love this map right here where you're looking at um, sort of suitability for a range of species, um, and normally with a certainly with a CLN map on the left. Um, where the, the the blue areas are are um, are urban, and you look at the aggregate of suitability for these species, and it's very difficult now to pick out the urban areas. 
So this is this is again such a promising first step into, as Allison said, you know, sort of adding some color to the urban areas in in the CLN. Um, and actually, if I if you wouldn't mind going back a couple of slides, there was a quick screenshot of the conservation portfolio report. It's it's going to be um, sorry about the the slide order here, right here. This is one of the things that we have envisioned for um, how this information would come into the CLN. This is a screenshot of the conservation portfolio report that you can um, customize, you can create um, for an area of your interest in the Bay Area currently at bayarealands.org. And, and this is a, a, a mixture of species in natural areas um, that are, are presumed to be there. Um, it, but ho however, what would it look like if we had a similar list of potential species and similar uh, mapped priority areas for urban areas. And that would that could become a sort of an urban module of the conservation lands network. So that's something that we're shooting shooting toward. But with that, um, I just want to um, invite um, Annie back to the stage and um, lead us in some Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Tom, and thank you everyone on the project team for sharing your stories, um, sharing your experiences. And uh, I'm really excited to invite you back, all of you onto this proverbial stage. Perhaps we could stop the screen sharing of the slides and see just this project team up here. Um, and I'm happy to take questions from the, from the audience. So if you have some, please put it into the chat. We're too many people to do the, to go off off mute and, and ask questions verbally. So we'd really love to hear your questions, but please put them in the chat. And to start us off, um, I wanna ask a question around shifting paradigms. Um, we, the title of this webinar is about shifting paradigms and each of you have talked about how things have been done and how, how we were trying and exploring new things and how they could be done. Um, we, uh, have talked a lot about like what we as a team we've talked about how we learned kind of growing up um either professionally or in just life experience and how um how things how conservation is done is sometimes different so i'm curious if you could talk about um how this project has helped you see some of those shifts what is, what do those shifts look like and actually i wonder if we could start with olivia Great. For me, I think it's just really exciting and why I love being in this field is just to really incorporate um, CBOs and have these relationships within the conservation field and to think about um, access to nature and to think about the movement to diversify who we see in nature and who we see in science. You know, there's several movements happening, like amplifying and, and showcasing, you know, many, many people who have been in science, but who haven't been at the forefront. And one of those projects at Cal Academy is called Hidden Figures, you know, and that's also a movie of that we saw and people that have definitely been involved in STEM and our key people um, in our histories. And I think that's just really exciting to also continue to see that today. And another piece is just that nature is everywhere. Um, nature is in our urban areas. Nature is in where we live. And nature is all around us all the time. And the narrative that's shifting for me and has, has never really been um, something that I haven't understood, but for many traditional conservation groups and people, it was like the city's here and nature's over there or nature's in the national parks or nature's in the national forest. And you have to go out there uh, to experience it um, versus a very important change and shift of nature's right in my backyard, nature's when I'm walking down the street in San Francisco or in Richmond or in Oakland. And um, I just really am passionate about that message and appreciate that this project has also amplified that and we're seeing it um, in CLN. Awesome, thank you, Olivia. Tom, I, I'd love to ask you the same question. How, does, how, do, how do you um, 
see, think, feel the, the shifting paradigms? And, and can you name, you know, kind of what that looks like for you from where you yeah. sit? From where I sit, there's two things that are uh, kind of central to the kind of shifting paradigm. One is for the scientists on the call, there has always been a an avoidance of um, kind of unofficial data. Um, community science has um, historically just been seen as um, problematic that we can't trust it. And what what if we have you know type one and type two errors, um, those kinds of things based on the the way the data were collected. But the the applications that are out there, like iNaturalist, um, kind of disrupt that that whole way of thinking with the idea of research grade observations. Um, so that's a big paradigm shifter right there. Um, and so uh, myself, I, I I was one of those people who was um, uh, averse to to using citizen science data or community community science data because of the worry. But I, I no longer believe that anymore. Um, there's ways to sort of, you know, stand firmly on on those, you know, many, many, many points that um, Allison and Rebecca had in there. The second thing is, is um, a kind of a paradigm shift in um, thinking about the CLN um, users. We're learning through this project pro uh, project that, yes, um, uh, you know, on the ground conservation and and stewardship organizations are and will always be central and key to the conservation uh, world. But incorporating cities, we can't put all of that on our conservation organizations. They don't necessarily work in cities. Um, they don't have mandates there. They don't have jurisdiction there. So it really becomes the cities and the municipalities become central users of the CLN information. And that's kind of a brain shift for me as well to think like, what are their needs? What are their information needs? What are the ways that they have catcher's mitts for this information to come in? Do they have any catcher's mitts? Uh, so that's been, um, that's another way that we need to sort of shift. Awesome, great. Rebecca, I wanna to come to you and then um, wanna talk about uh, lessons learned um, to the rest of the groups. But Rebecca, talk, can you talk about shifting paradigms from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, what Tom and Olivia highlighted really for me, like those things together is the paradigm that I think, you know, Allison and I in our um, center's work have really been trying to shift for, for years. And I think that, you know, this project was just brought all the pieces together in this way for me that was really, really powerful. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it takes longer and it's harder work um, because not everyone's coming from the exact same starting point. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it like richer and more rewarding and more fulfilling and more robust in the end because we all learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for me, when I see some of those maps that, that Avery showed, at the end, especially the one that, you know, you can't really tell where the urban areas begin and end with the, the like areas of, of distribution, you know, this is like the world that we all actually experience. And so, and that we have been trying to like convey to people through community science events and bio blitzes for the last 10 years, right? And so to see that in data form um, is really powerful for, for me and, um, I just hope that we can take the work that we've done all together and, you know, think about this, all the next steps that we can do um, to really bring these data for, to planning, to build the consortiums of people, consortia of people that are needed to make those decisions, like Tom was saying, and, um, and engage more and more communities in thinking about this work and for us to think about including them in decision-making as well. So to me, like, I saw those little bits of um, shifting paradigms, so. Awesome, that's great, thank you. Um, I wanna shift to, to lessons learned um, and I wanna share a quick one um, and then Vencel and then Allison and Avery, I wanna hear from you too. Um, the, um, this project's not done. So this is not a summary. This is not a conclusion, you know, kind of end of project kind of uh, webinar. Um, and we're really excited to 
to be sharing these lessons because it also is the process of learning them ourselves. You know, when you have to present, you have to figure it out what you're, <laughs> what you want to say. And one thing I want to highlight kind of that I've heard implicitly in my colleagues' presentations is the time it, we all took time to really think about to build relationships and to think about our the mental constructs that we're working in the frameworks we're working in um, and sometimes those frameworks are so uh, invisible that i mean we've been working within them for so long that we we're not actually aware of them anymore um, and i think one of the observations i have of the process we've been on is a process of bumping up against or becoming aware of those frameworks and then challenging them, questioning them, turning them around and upside down and, and exploring them. And so, um, and I think that's a part of what's happening at a larger macro scale um, in our society is, oh, this is how this has been done for 50 years. Do we want to do it the same way anymore? Maybe not. And let's think about that. And sometimes that's really easy and it's, um, that's a joyful, fun switch. Sometimes that's a really painful, hard switch um, to, to, to adapt those different frameworks. Anyway, that's one thing that I've observed and learned. Um, Vencel, I'm curious, at what, what's one thing that you've learned on this project? Thank you, Annie. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, um, the, the tool, the iNaturalist tool, first of all, was new to me. Um, bio blitzes were new when when Allison first brought this up I'm like what is a bio blitz and that's how we came to when when Rebecca and, and Allison invited me to the one in July of 2022 I'm like oh okay now I see what's going on that day they found um I don't know if it was amphibious uh, amphibious species but they, they found a species of, of that that had thought to have been extinct and I was and I was shocked by that I've, I've been a little um a nature, a little nature, um, like gobbler of information since I was a little kid watching KQED, you know, and so this is right in my wheelhouse. And we currently have a um, a grant with the Coastal Conservancy where we're doing our, you know, our cohort, the C3 cohort, our Coastal Conservation um, Corps with our 16, 18 year olds. Like um, right now we're fighting for um, advocacy for getting signage and working with City of Richmond for San Pablo Creek. So I'm like now that I know what a bio blitz is, we can go. We can go at the spot of um of, of the the site of, of where we're focused, do a bio blitz there, and we can also go upstream to just under the dam at Kennedy Grove and do a bio blitz there, which is already in our curriculum for this year. So it just added so so much diversity and and fun science like advocates in so many ways. It just excites the minds of of me, not only me but our participants as well. So. I hope that yeah that's so anyway. great i mean if that's not what we want to do in life <laughs> i don't know what we want to do like uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing um uh, it makes my heart happy um avery uh what's one lesson that you learned and then allison i'm curious about a call to action and then we'll wrap up avery great um thanks annie um and for all the thoughtful answers uh you know land management affects you know the way the land is managed affects everyone and i think that everyone should have uh the opportunity to engage with land management and i i i learned really the importance of that in this project and also the the importance the incredible importance of like building these relationships we've been talking about that a lot but it's just so special that like the data scientists <laughs> is engaging with like the the community members and the community organizers and and the conservation practitioners and like that, the, the, the connections formed in this group, I think are, are absolutely essential um, in, in, in this kind of work. That's great, the blending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, thank you, Avery. Allison, can you take us home? I know you're a baseball fan, so you're, you get to like, you know, help us close this out. Uh, what's a call to action? What, what can the folks watching and listening today do with what we've been all talking about? So easy, Annie. Right. Go out and make observations. Take photos <laughs> of the nature that you see all around you and post them on iNaturalist. Um, not only does that help inform now what's happening in the Bay Area with conservation planning, 
Um, we also have, a, I see some of our state partners on this call. We also have a partnership with the state to bring in actual estate ad, actually state decision-making tools as well. So wherever you are, those observations that you make, whether it's something super common or super rare, like every observation matters if you share it and turn it into a data point by putting it on iNaturalist. Um, and that's something that, you know, if you're, if you have access to nature, which hopefully you all do, and if you have a way to take a photo, um, something that all of us can do. I, I, that was like a soft, soft pitch, I think, to Allison of uh, a call to action. Um, <laughs> you asked me a call for action for anything, and that's almost always going to be my Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I should have known. Um, everybody, please join me in thanking these fabulous people for sharing their story and for sharing their experience and uh, wisdom and lessons learned. Um, I'll say it's a total pleasure working with this team and on this project. It's really been a ton of fun. Um, and I want to leave you all with a thought that uh, you are all in nature right now, wherever you are. It may be a gray, beige, no, I think it was a beige cubicle was how it was described in the chat. And you're, you're in nature. Um, we're not apart from, we are a part of. So with that, um, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you all so much for coming. And um, please reach out if you have any questions and stay tuned for more information about this project as we keep on going. Thank you all for coming.